Today we have an entitled parent story of a ruined family get together. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, parents think they get a say so over my children. My ex and I separated beginning of the year, and I moved into my mom's house with my two kids. They're both under three. My parents do not like my ex, as he hasn't helped much financially. He puts in effort on seeing the kids and talking to them. My oldest got sick and can't go to daycare for a week, so I contacted him and asked if he could watch the kids for a week. I can't miss work or I'll get fired. He said he would, no problem. The problem is when I told my mom what was going on, she thinks she gets a say-so on my kids having a relationship with their dad. My ex and I had a rocky end, and that is between us and not our kids. I believe as long as he puts in effort, it's not my place to say he can't have a relationship with his kids. My parents have also offered to pay for my divorce, but only on the terms that I get his parental rights terminated. My parents don't like the guy that much, so I of course have not took that offer. The big gripe is my mom thinking she's my kid's parent, and treating me like a child and like I get no say so over my children. So now it's about to be a whole argument with my mother over this, and I'm standing my ground. It's just incredibly frustrating to deal with this. Honestly, I think one of the hardest things I've discovered is saying no to my parents. I mean, when you're raised in a way where you're never supposed to say no, you kind of get used to that mindset a little bit. But it is one of those things, I think, where you have to say to them, respectfully, I understand how you feel, but you have to respect what I want and feel as the parent of these kids. I don't know if this has been like a recurring theme for OP throughout their life, but there's definitely a point where you have to stop letting them try to make decisions for you. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy these stories of entitled parents, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, Entitled parents think I should change my haircut. So, I got my haircut last week. My mom wanted me to go get it done. I'm under 18, so I'm legally not an adult, but I'm old enough to be able to make decisions about my haircut. I go to the hairdressers with my mom and she gets annoyed at me when I say the haircut I wanted because she didn't want it that way. She usually likes my hair really short and I look like Charlie Brown from Snoopy when it's done her way. I wanted to cut it a bit short but keep my fringe and try to get a normal style going on my head. So she keeps talking crap about me the whole time and when I get home, her and my dad both get mad at me and demand to get it redone. I say I'm not getting it bald, more or less. They let me keep it this way but talk crap about my hair and how I'm ridiculous looking to everyone we see. This is just kinda sad because I think they're just trying to make OP feel bad and self-conscious so that they give in and listen to their parents and get the haircut they want. OP knows what they're doing with their hair, OP knows what they like, and even if it's not a conventional thing that most people have or most people would look at and go, oh yeah that's normal, who cares, it's OP's hair to wear how they want. Our next story is, my dad is beginning to act entitled to things I make. For context, my dad, 64 year old male, used to volunteer to coach track at the same middle school where my mom teaches. Because of this position, he ended up meeting a lot of students from my grade and below for years. Sometimes he'll ask me, do you remember so and so? And sometimes the answer is yes, and sometimes the answer is no. I've gotten back into crocheting recently, and around mid-September dad asked, do you remember John Smith? He was a year below you in high school. I tell him no, but to go on with what he's saying. He tells me that John Smith and his wife are having a baby and he thinks it would be nice for me to make a baby blanket for them. At first, I happily agreed because I love babies and I already had the perfect yarn for it at home. Later on in October, my dad asked how it was going and only then tells me the baby is due in November. I started panicking a little, so when I got home, I was ranting to my husband about this sudden deadline because I'd been working on scarves for people for Christmas and suddenly had a new thing due sooner, and my husband asks, why are you doing this for him? Do you even know the guy? I admitted that I didn't and my husband said I didn't owe my dad or this John Smith guy anything and that if my dad wants to try to give the guy a blanket so bad, he can go buy one. I even pulled out one of my yearbooks from junior and senior years of high school and there was no John Smith in any of the grades for either year. I decided to not make the blanket. Cue this past Sunday when my dad said, I need that blanket. Didn't ask, just said he needed it while we were out for lunch. I calmly said that I was working on Christmas scarves for people. Dad replied, the baby is due in November. Christmas is in December. As if I didn't know this. I calmly said, dad, I don't even know the guy. And dad got all frustrated and said, never mind, just forget about it, with an annoyed tone. 
We continued lunch and at one point, I mentioned hoping to purchase a sewing machine someday so I can make t-shirt quilts. One for shirts I have from events in my life. Shirts that basically can't be replaced and are special to me. And one for my state t-shirt collection. Hoping to visit and collect a shirt from every state. My mom mentions I can order some shirts online for states that I've been to but didn't get a shirt, and dad said if he'd known, he would have grabbed me one while he and my sister were in Minnesota last month. I thanked him but I explained I wanted to visit the states myself. He grumbled something and then said, you know what would be cool? A quilt made of all my t-shirts from insert favorite college football team and smiles at me. At first I liked the idea and said, if you can get them to me I'll try. But the more I think about it, the more I don't like that his attitude tends to be telling me to make things, rather than asking if I can or even want to make them. I mean, his idea is cool and it would be cute to make that for him, but I completely understand where OP's coming from, where you don't want to be told. And like, I guess they're kind of asking or proposing without actually properly asking. I agree with OP that it's a lot easier mentally to do something and commit to something if you're actually asked instead of told. It's kind of like that age old thing where you're finally going to clean your room yourself, you have the mojo, you're going to do it, and then your parent swoops by at the last second and goes, clean your room up. Do you really want to anymore? Our next story is, my younger sister is pregnant and my mom is trying to get her to keep the child. We are not ready to add an infant to this household. So I don't know if this is the right place for this, but this is literally driving me nuts and maybe writing it out will help. But honestly, I'm just hoping someone can help me talk some sense into my mother who listens to people reading Reddit. And I honestly don't care if she knows it's me sharing this. She's being entitled by thinking she has a say in what my younger sister does. Me, female 23, just found out my younger sister, female 16, is pregnant by her boyfriend, who I don't even know how old he is. I just know that I've barely seen him in our house, and for good reason. I'm the oldest of six kids, with this sister, let's call her middle sister, because she's the eldest out of the second group of kids that came after me, and the other two who are all in our 20s at this point. It was late, getting into the wee hours of the morning and I couldn't sleep, so I decided I might as well mess around on Fortnite to grind and hopefully get a little sleepy, when my mom, female mid 40s I think, comes in and just kinda starts standing behind me. When I ask her what she wants, she just asks me if I can pause the game. Not in a serious we need to talk tone, but more in a this is something you should know kind of way. I expected her to show me some Facebook post or something on Messenger from someone she doesn't care for, as at this point I'm quite used to being the one she goes to in order to rant about these sorts of things. It's honestly emotionally draining, but I don't know how to tell her I'm not interested in hearing her complain all the time. She pulls out a pregnancy test and shows me. When I get confused and don't know how to react, she proceeds to tell me that it's not the sister who was born two years after me, who is 21 and currently engaged, living at home with her fiancé until they can get enough together to move elsewhere, and that it's one of the middle siblings. She tells me that middle sibling had said she didn't want to keep the child, but at this point it was way too late to get an abortion or anything else, but according to my mom, we don't do that in this household. My sister is not ready to be a parent in any way. She's failing homeschool, she lays around and watches TV all day long, and has basically made the living room into her bedroom. Never mind that she has a perfectly good room upstairs. Not to mention she still ends up wetting herself in her sleep on a regular basis. The house is not good, I'm going to be honest. With this many people, dishes pile up, and nobody but my mother and me seem to want to do them. And on top of that, there's just so much clutter all around the house. We don't have space for a baby. We don't have the money for a baby. I'm on food stamps at this moment. So is the engaged sister. So is my mother. If we were to bring a child into this household, I do not see that kid ending up well off or in any way okay. I tried to talk with middle sibling just a little bit ago and explain to her that nobody could make her keep that kid. That she wasn't ready. That this home wasn't ready for a kid. But she just kind of clammed up and told me that our mom had been talking with her and planning for the future, trying to get her to think of names for the kid and everything. I don't know what's going on through her head, but I know full well that our mother is manipulating her, that all our mother wants is another baby around the house and isn't thinking of the long term. She's not a young mother anymore and middle sibling is in no way ready to be a parent. 
I know I have to have this talk with my mother, but I'm afraid of what she's going to say or think, as she often comes to me with adult situations and then doesn't seem to actually listen when I have adult opinions about it. What can I do to talk with her about this? To convince my younger sister that she doesn't have to do this unless she's 100% certain she does. I'm at a loss for words and I can feel myself spiraling the more I think about this. While it's very true that they don't have to keep this kid, that they're not going to be forced to keep the kid, it's also true that if the mother is convincing them to keep the kid and they decide, yeah, I want to keep the kid, that they have every right to keep the kid. I think it's completely fair for OP to go to both people, make a case of laying out why it's probably not right, but ultimately, if they make that decision that they do want to keep the kid and try to raise them, I don't think there's any way for OP to force the issue, as much of a mistake as they may think it would be. I would just say if they do happen to keep the kid and they're around, if I were in OP's shoes, I would not be volunteering for any babysitting duties. Miss me with that whole it takes a village guilt trip. Our next story is, parents have a real estate obsession. I know this may sound tone deaf, but here goes. My parents have this unhealthy obsession for real estate outside of their price range. This has really gotten on my nerves recently as houses is all they talk about. I am dead serious when I say their favorite pastime activity is going to real estate listings. I have pretty much seen the inside of every single gated residential that's been built in our city for the last 10 years because that was how we spent a lot of our weekends. They always request to see the largest units with 5 or 6 bedrooms because a family of 4, now that I'm not home most of the time, just needs that much space. They've sold smaller houses here and there, but all of that has pretty much gone towards financing bigger real estate purchases. Gross rental yield is terrible, so these houses pretty much collect dust all year round. Whenever I advise against making a purchase, they say something along the lines of, people buy houses, that's just what they do. Recently while I was out of the country, they had me sign over a first property preferential discount that I was entitled to despite me saying specifically that I prefer to leave it for the time being. When I raised my suspicions, they tried convincing me that this was a huge steal, that the house came with a 20 square foot garden and elevator and everything. For what they were charged, it should have come with a bat cave. I suggested maybe selling a house to help pay for the new one only to be told that experts do not think this is a good time to sell. It is just never a good time to sell, I guess. I do not think they're the way they are as a result of being undereducated or susceptible to guerrilla marketing, as they are the senior university dean slash management. To the best of my understanding, my parents feel they missed out on the real estate booms several decades ago. What they're doing now, I can only categorize as overcompensating or preparation in the event a sequel occurs. We're on good terms most of the time and I don't want to come across as ungrateful for what they've done for me. When I began to get critical of them, their strategy thus far has been to guilt me by bringing up their friends, who have been successful at converting their children into submissive house hoarders. If it comes to it, I trust that they will respect my decisions, but I'm hoping this does not affect relationships. This is kind of a rant, but would appreciate any suggestions or advice. I acknowledge that to some, this sounds like whining or even flexing, because despite having partial ownership, it doesn't benefit me one bit. Potentially, while not legally, entangles me into loan or mortgage situations I would rather play no part in. Parents literally pull out the seniority card all the time and refuse to look at market research or evidence that says otherwise. So, the one thing I don't understand is if they were overcompensating for like the previous market crash that I'm assuming OP's referencing to around 2007 to like 2009. If that's what they're talking about and they're preparing for the next one to come along, isn't that the wrong way to go about it? Wouldn't you rather have just bare assets that you can spend to acquire the properties? Because isn't the idea that once it does crash, you buy everything at a low, low, low price and then flip it when it's worth much more? I mean, it varies depending on where you live, but I would think now is the time to sell because, at least from what I've seen, housing prices are crazy. This next story is, I probably developed a chronic pain condition and my mom doesn't believe me. What do I do? So, for context, I've been dealing with headaches for the past three months as of now and it's been interfering with my life. 
The headache started sometime after the first two weeks of school. School started on the 14th of August, and it's November the 7th as I'm typing this out. And for the first few days as the headaches occurred, I thought I was just faking or maybe I was stressed. It wasn't until they still kept happening after about a week that I started to feel something wasn't right. So I asked my mom about it, and she told me it was normal, so I left it at that. Fast forward to about a month, and I was in so much pain to the point that even my dad was starting to notice, and asked my mom to take me to the doctor. She sounded hesitant too at first, but eventually I went in. The doctor was doing her normal evaluation, and then asked me to describe the symptoms of my headaches to her. Before I could actually get a whole lot across, my mom talked over me and told the doctor that I wasn't drinking water and wasn't eating breakfast in the mornings anymore. She basically minimized my symptoms then and there. Now, it's important to keep in mind here that I have sensory issues due to being autistic. And drinking water, as much as it sounds dumb to say it, causes a negative sensory reaction. Same with protein bars and Gatorade. It's also important to note that because of the pain from my headaches, I had to stop eating in the mornings because my eyes and head are in so much pain. I ended up leaving the doctor's office with a simple diagnosis of headaches. And during that time, I felt completely invalidated, mainly because my mom minimized how bad the issue actually was, and now the doctor won't believe me. The headache started to get worse, even while I was taking the doctor's orders, and eventually I stopped seeing the point in doing it anymore and eventually stopped. This ended up causing my mom to have another excuse to invalidate me. After about two more months of trips to the nurse's office, having to stay home, and the occasional crying from the severe pain and mental health problems that arose from these headaches, I couldn't handle it anymore. Which leads to today. So after I relapsed my SH due to my only coping mechanism throughout these entire three months, that being my phone, being taken, I decided to look up if my headaches could be linked to anything, and as it turns out, there is a rare chronic headache condition that exists called New Daily Persistent Headaches, and the description matches exactly to what I was feeling. So I sent a Teams chat to the nurse, and while she can't do a diagnosis without authorization, she believes me. At least I'm pretty sure she does. She asked me to print out a copy of the article I'd saw and show it to my mom. So I did, alongside a list of the symptoms I exhibited over the past three months for her to compare the list to the article. And I hoped that at that point she'd actually take a look and believe me. Well, golly was I wrong. The second I told her about the condition, she scoffed at me and told me that I didn't have NDPH. Even though it's pretty obvious, plus we can't actually be sure until I see a doctor about it, that the doctors aren't going to believe me because I've been doing what the doctors told me to do and that I shouldn't be using WebMD for my research, even though I used an article from the Cleveland Clinic. She also kept asking me provocative questions about the last time I drank water, even though I explained numerous times that I stopped because it wasn't working whatsoever and just leaving me in more pain, and she overall just proved how little she was actually willing to listen to me when it came down to this. My eyes are currently sore from crying as I'm typing this, and I just want to say I'm ticked as freak. She pretty much knew that I wasn't doing okay and that something was clearly wrong, but she cares more about some stupid butt speech that is never getting done because of my headaches more than the physical health of her child. By this point, I'm considering ending things over this because it's gotten so bad to the point I can't leave the house on the weekends. I have basically no friends, I don't have a dream job because every opportunity was shattered by my headaches, and my mental health is slowly but drastically getting worse, and I'm pretty sure my mom won't care if I did it, judging from the numerous times she's invalidated my depression, headaches, burnout, basically everything bad happening to me, and all because in her eyes I'm lazy. No, Cheryl, just because you have headaches yourself does not mean you get to tell someone how to feel about their headaches, or whether or not they even have a condition that causes headaches, let alone your kids, the tiny morsels you have to take care of until they're 18. If your child suspects they might have a chronic health condition and have provided you with research, listen to them, period. I mean, I wholeheartedly understand OP has sensory issues with water. It's definitely not going to do you any service not drinking water regularly. That said, if these headaches are so debilitating, I would say OP needs to just straight up call 911. If they're not willing to take you to the doctor to get properly treated and figure out what is going on, and you can't even live your life at this point because you're in so much pain, 
You should get yourself to the emergency room and get yourself actually treated. This is full-blown child neglect. This next story is Unbelievable Insensitivity Ruins Family Get-Together. Disclaimer, I didn't witness the main event since I only arrived later that evening, but I witnessed the fallout and my sister filled me in on the rest. The entitled parents in question are my sister's sister-in-law, a high school teacher for music and maths, as well as a Catholic theologian, and her husband. The husband is a university professor from an upper-class family who strongly believes that his supreme intellect and background elevate him above the plebeians, and he makes no attempts at hiding this. As parents of an upcoming genius, they expect preferential treatment even from their family members while strictly reglementing their child's contact with lesser people, such as his cousins. The poor kid is never left alone. Every movement is watched, playtime is often interrupted because he shouldn't spend too much time with other children and play with intellect developing toys by himself instead. You get the type. Now this is what happened. We had a little get together at my sister's place over a holiday, in part to support her brother-in-law and his girlfriend who had lost their child about six weeks earlier and were just starting to re-engage with society after a period of intense grief. Since it was the first evening and everyone was just arriving, my sister and her husband had decided to just order some pizza for everyone. Because they live outside of the city limits, the pizza place wouldn't deliver and someone had to drive there and pick up the goods. My sister was still busy preparing snacks, her husband was handling the kids, his parents had just arrived after a long drive and needed some rest. The professor was above such simple tasks, and the sister-in-law had her own child to care for. But she had an idea about who could pick up the pizza. She turned toward her brother and his girlfriend and said to them, Hey, since you're the only ones who don't have a child, why don't you go and pick up the pizza? Except for the children, the room went silent for a moment. Then the girlfriend broke down, sobbing, and the brother's face turned white before he also started to cry and the two left the room. When I arrived about an hour later, the mood in the room was icy. My sister's brother-in-law and his girlfriend had gone to their guest room and not reappeared. My sister, her husband, and his parents had had a heated exchange with the sister-in-law, who steadfastly refused to admit that she had said anything wrong. She insisted that she had merely stated a fact, that they had had enough time to grief and it was time to get over it and that she and my sister as actual mothers deserved support, even from those two. Meanwhile, the professor remained aloof, just watching things unfold from the sidelines after confirming that his wife's statement had been factually correct. There was also a lot of cold pizza, since my brother-in-law had handed the kids over to my sister and picked up the pizza himself, but nobody had any real appetite left. When I got up next morning, my sister told me that her brother-in-law and his girlfriend had left earlier that morning, apologizing and telling her that they couldn't spend the weekend in the presence of his sister and, in fact, didn't want to see her again for a long time. For the rest of the weekend, nobody was in the mood to do much. We went for extended walks where my sister, her husband and I, formed a group while his parents had lengthy discussions with their daughter, who had become the weekend's pariah and only cemented her status with her incessant whining about her unfair treatment and lack of support for her as a mother. Other than that, we didn't do much apart from talking, watching some films, and especially ignoring her. What a fun weekend we had. At least they won't be coming to this year's family Christmas party. Honestly, I'm surprised they were allowed to just get away with this absolutely mindless statement. What you said was correct. But at what cost? Didn't think about anybody's feelings or consideration at all. Our next story is entitled Grandparents. So this isn't my family per se, but my roommates. Recently his parental figure passed away and was cremated. He was defined as next of kin, and due to Michigan law he has to determine who was to have the ashes. While his grandparents said they wished to have it, my roommate stated that he didn't believe his parent would want that, as they actively avoided the grandparents due to extensive emotional and mental abuse throughout their life, and stated he would keep the ashes as he's next of kin. They grumbled, but my roommate thought that was the end of it. Over the past few weeks, they've called and called and called, and once sent the grandfather to try and reason with my roommate, which ended with my roommate saying that his parent wouldn't have wanted to be stuck eternally with their abusive mother and the grandfather stated something along the lines of, well, you're right about that. Again, my roommate thought it was over. 
until he went to get the paperwork for the autopsy report and found out that his grandfather had been there the day before and acquired several copies. A few days later, his grandfather delivered a note from the funeral home stating that his grandparents had come forward later and stated that he was not the next of kin and he was to release the ashes to his grandparents lest they seek legal action against him. That's what happened just this night, but even my roommate's uncle stated he was next of kin. I would also like to state the grandparents didn't pay for anything. They had my roommate or my roommate's family's friends pay for everything. And up until the problem with Ashes, they called him grandson and everything. He's not technically biologically related to the parent. It's an odd situation, but he was raised by the deceased. And the parent cared enough about my roommate to get his initials as a tattoo and refer to him as their child. Right now we're trying to figure out the best way to tell his grandparents to screw off because we don't believe they have a leg to stand on. What do you all think? Honestly, this is why it's so important to get a will done if you can, and then just update it every so often, every few years when you think of it, or you have something that you know you want to tweak. I'm no lawyer. As far as in the eyes of the law, I don't know how much of a leg you have to stand on. I just would imagine if you're going against somebody who is biologically related versus someone who is called their kid in every scenario possible but is not linked biologically or through any actual record, I would imagine it would be an uphill battle. This next story is, Entitled Parent Put Me Into Debt To Buy A Car For Her Spoiled Second Child. Yep, you read that correctly, my mother is very entitled. Actually, you cannot do anything apart from what she's demanding. She cannot communicate or she is not willing to comprehend anything that you are actually communicating. In 2018, she asked, demanded, me to sign some papers for a new car. Basically, she was buying a new car under my name, so when I would get my license, that car would be mine. I thought she was paying in cash. Instead, to buy a Fiat 500 for my sister, she made me sign a loan. I didn't know it, so she could fully pay my sister's car and let her live her life debt-free. I didn't have that privilege. This kind of financial abuse and bullying literally set me under every achievement anyone my age had. I had to focus on survival, so no degree for me, no license for me, nothing. Had to spend my days worrying how to repair her disastrous choices. I literally need like a good seven-eighths of therapy just because of the financial abuse. No one I know had the same experiences. It's also very alienating. I have PTSD from debt collectors threatening me. Some of them were also very sorry and compassionate. I would imagine a lot of this is already in the rear view, but man, like you see this situation and you kind of wish that you had a time machine where you could go back and try to figure out something legally that you could do to protect yourself. I mean, that you were tricked into signing this. I honestly can't imagine having the anxiety where your phone's ringing and you're not sure if this is going to be some predatory debt collector who's just about willing to threaten you to try to get money from you. This next story is... I think I had my first toxic boy mom encounter. My family, myself, fiance, and baby boy went to visit my cousin for a few days last week. The day we arrived, we all went to pick her daughter, my first cousin once removed, I'll call her my niece for short, up from school. When we got there, she was chatting with a boy friend of hers. She saw us, hugged him goodbye, and ran in our direction. My niece talked to us for less than 30 seconds before turning her attention to my son. She cooed over him for a while before taking my fiancé's hand and having him show our baby around to her classmates. I stood next to my cousin waiting for them. As soon as my niece was out of earshot, someone called my cousin's name. It was the boy's mom. She was holding her son in her lap. She reached us, pointed her finger at my cousin and said, You need to teach your daughter to behave herself. She shouldn't be talking to my son and they shouldn't be hugging. They're way too young for that. She then left the classroom without waiting for a reply. They're both five. He was complimenting her Shrek Crocs. This is just sad because if any ounce of that rubs off on their kid, their kid is probably going to grow up afraid of having any kind of contact with people. I mean, it's nice that the kid was in the mom's lap at least because I'm afraid that the kid would go home and be touch starved, that their parents would be afraid of hugging or cuddling their own kid. Not gonna lie, it's something that I grew up with and struggled. I had no concept growing up of hugging friends, of having any kind of friendly, platonic, human touch. 
But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another absolutely crazy entitled parent story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.